Thanks a lot, everyone, for participating. Today, we have a great uh, guest speaker. He is known by many as one of the top uh, music photographers in the world. He shot everyone from Van Halen, Led Zeppelin, uh, David Bowie, Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue, The Rat, Rolling Stones, U2, Kiss, Michael Jackson, Tom Waits, and uh, has shaped the, uh, the rock and roll landscape for decades. So I want to introduce everyone to Neil Zlozauer, otherwise known as the Zlaz. And today we're going to be talking uh, about some very interesting things uh, related to uh, licensing agreements and how you could protect your business by making sure that the licensing agreements are very tight. And I want you to uh, hear from uh, Neil uh, how he does his work. And he's been in the business for many, many years. Uh, I uh, had uh, worked with Neil for uh, numerous years. And uh, interestingly enough, I asked him for an invoice from 1984. And next thing you know, he whipped it out and he found it. And it was the golden ticket to one of his cases. So uh, you're going to hear from him. We're going to talk a little bit about the case. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, Neil Slozauer uh, in Los Angeles. Hey, Neil. Hey, folks out there. How y'all doing? Thanks a lot for being here, Neil, today and for participating. No problem. I hope I can help some of those future photographers uh, get their, their act together as far as business goes. So. So a little bit before we go delve into Neil Slozauer, I know many of you have seen my presentations before, but uh, I am a photographer and also copyright lawyer. Uh, and uh, you could see some of my work at richardlebowitzphotography.com. Uh, I published a book called Apprentice Lessons Learned on the Front Lines of Life, where I traveled with an award-winning photojournalist, uh, a member of the Copyright Society of the USA, and also a member of the New York Press Photographers Association. All right. So we're going to introduce uh, Neil Slozauer. So Neil, tell us a little bit about you. Well, I lived in Los Angeles all my life. When I was younger, 1969, I brought my camera to the Rolling Stones at the Forum. Back then, they didn't have the security guards. I had the nosebleed seats in the $4.50 section. I'm like, screw this. Walked up to the front of the stage and hung with my idols, Mick and Keith all night shooting photos. Then I went to 10 years after, then Led Zeppelin, then all the other bands in the day, The Who, Candy, shop photos, basically just to put on my walls at home, my bedroom walls as a glorified fan, and one thing turned into the next, and the next turned into whatever, and here I am 51 years later, still in the music industry, which is pretty much non-existent in this day and age. But uh, I've had a good, long, you know, fulfilling career doing what at one time I really enjoyed and loved doing, shooting photos of all the greatest musicians in the world. Oh, that's great. So, Neil, so how'd you meet these bands? Did you just go into the concerts and just you know, and meet them, like just hanging out with them? How, how did that? Well, back then it was a lot easier, but you know, back then you could bring cameras to a live venue. There was none of this, you know, you can't bring your cameras in and they didn't even have three songs back then. Now, if you get a photo pass, you basically get three songs and then they escort you out unless you have a ticket. But I started off shooting the live photos. And then from there, you know, I latched up with a couple magazines or whatever, and they're like, hey, Neil, we wanted to go shoot B.B. King at his hotel. Can you do that? Or go shoot whoever it was, Rory Gallagher. So then I'd go with the writers, Steve Rosen at the time. He did the interview. And after the interview, I go, hey, excuse me, Mr. King, can I take you outside and do some photos or whatever? You know, my photos back then, it was sort of what they call army style shooting. I brought no lights, whatever. I used natural available light. I tried to look at the lighting I had on hand and posed them wherever I could to make the best of what I had to work with back in the day. Oh, very interesting. So do you think a lot of the relationships, you know, uh, um, you know, really helped your career, like establishing like personal relationships with some of these band members? Right. Well, m most people consider my beginning working with Van Halen because that was the band that exploded 
and they were a pretty visual band. So I latched up with them in 78 and worked with them from 78 to 84. And, you know, back in those days, Van Halen could do no wrong. So pretty much, you know, let alone we were all the same age and we had the same likes and interests, basically girls and more girls and more girls. But uh, what do you call it? So we were like one big family, more or less, back then. So, yes. And then I started working with Quiet Riot and then Rad and then Poison and then Guns and Roses. Okay. So one of my things about being a rock photographer is you got to be able to call which bands you think are going to be big later on so you got to get them in the beginning because once they're big everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon and shoot them but when they're young in the early days of their career and they're broke and they have no money and you're working with them then they remember that when you get when they get bigger and more popular and hopefully you rise to the top with them and that's what i did with all the bands i just mentioned whether it was motley or rad or poison or or you know uh, van halen i latched on them when they were nothing and then they sort of got big when they got big oh very interesting now how did you uh establish relationships with some of the magazines that you've licensed uh photographs um to how did that come about? Like for those out there that, you know, let you just shoot, re you know, either music or just anything, you know, did you establish any relationships with any of these, you know, publications when you were, you know, back in the day? Well, that's what you try to do. And the best way to get the access is to get a real magazine and try to latch up with them. So when fans come to town, you call up the magazine, the photo editor, the art director and say, hey, so-and-so is coming into town down can i shoot them for you and they'll call up and get you a photo pass in this day and age as i was telling you yesterday richard sometimes the bands would rather have a blogger shoot than a real professional photographer because some of the bloggers you know their audience is 50 100 plus thousand people so they feel hey we'd rather have this blogger who reaches a hundred thousand people than this magazine who only has a monthly subscription of five or 10,000 people. I mean, when I started, there was no internet. So everybody had to look at the photos in magazines, okay? Well, now all the magazines are faltering. I'm sure you've been to the newsstand and looked at them, and they're all paper thin, whether it's Playboy magazine or Rolling Stone magazine. I mean, they're pretty much non-existent in this day and age. Wow. So uh, back in the day, I mean, uh, or even today, how do you uh, determine the, the prices of your licenses? So let's say, you know, you photograph of uh, Van Halen and a magazine uh, contacts you to license. Uh, wh what, what do you say, you know, when they contact you? Well, basically, back then, it was way more respected to be a photographer because, you know, there was film and processing involved, and that was a pretty hefty duty expense. I mean, I used to charge my clients back uh, $30 for film processing and a snip test. So if I shot th 10 rolls, that's $300. Now you put in a 60 gigabyte memory card and you could shoot thousands of photos. And unfortunately, I hate to say it, I see with most photographers, there's not really a lot of attention to detail. Their philosophy is we'll fix it in the mix. So back then in the 70s and 80s, there weren't as many rock magazines in the 70s. There was Cream, there was Circus, there was Hit Parader. I used to do a lot of work for Guitar Player Magazine, which is still around to this day and age. But most magazines had a page rate. So if they used a page, a quarter page, they paid this price. If they paid a half page, they paid this price. If it was a full page, they paid this price. But you know, certain bands were harder to get photos of and certain photographers were a little bit more prominent than others. So maybe since, you know, back in the 70s, you know, I wasn't as, you know, I didn't have the 50 year career, you know, or, or the, uh, what do you want to say, the, the title I have now, whatever that is. But, you know, so I would usually go with the page rate unless it was really, really pathetic. And then I would try to squeak some more money out of the art department saying, hey, you know, these photos of Van Halen, you can't get these backstage photos. You, any photographer can usually get three songs live 
and three songs in Los Angeles look like three songs in Oregon or Seattle or Houston or New York City or Philadelphia. So there's no you know, difference in the three live songs anywhere across the U.S., but getting the artists off stage where you can control the situation and you can control the lighting and you can control everything, that's a little bit, that's worth more money as far as I'm concerned than any live photo. Did you have any mentors or idols uh, when you were starting out? Well, my idol was, without a doubt, Jim Marshall legendary rock and roll photographer that basically, I mean, he was really a photojournalist. I mean, back in the day when he shot Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and the Allman Brothers and Cream and everybody, he would hang with them. There weren't as many limitations back there as there are now. So he would go to their house and he would eat dinner with them and he'd get high with them and watch TV and go to the market with them and sleep on their floor. In this day and age, everything is a science. So someone could call me up. Okay, Neil, we have the Red Hot Chili Peppers coming to your store studio, and you have them from 12.05 p.m. till 12.39 and 30 seconds p.m. So you do whatever you could do in that half an hour or half an hour and 20 seconds, and then they need to leave when that time is done. It wasn't like that when Jim Marshall ruled the earth. And you know, Jim passed away about 10 years ago, but his photos untouchable by any other rock photographer, including myself. What I really learned from Jim more than anything is how to be a great businessman, okay? And not take any crap from any of the people that you're dealing with. Jim Marshall was brutal, you know? So Neil, so uh, I know, um that one of um, you know, uh, the most important things about being a photographer, as you say, is uh, being a great businessman. So tell me, wh what does that entail? You know? Okay, well, two, two things. So it doesn't matter if you're the greatest photographer on this planet, okay? To me, that's only 30% of being a photographer is shooting the photo. To me, more important than being an amazing photographer is being a great business person okay i'm an okay photographer but when it comes to business i'm a great business person and i answer the phone myself i do all my invoicing myself i write all my checks myself i reconcile my checking account by myself i do everything i don't even have assistants help me on photo shoots because they usually get in my way to be honest with you and, you know, I do everything myself. And that's what one of the photographer's biggest downfalls is. They think being a photographer is 100% shooting the photos. And we'll have this guy answer my phone. And we'll have this guy do my invoicing. And this guy will write my checks. And they lose track of how their business is running and operating. And it just, it's not a good thing. So I do everything myself. And my business runs pretty flawlessly whatever there is to my business in this day and age. Because with COVID and magazines faltering, you know, it's not like it was in the 80s and 90s and so on. But I always know how to make money. So I'm fine. I license my old photos, which you've seen some flashing before you on the screen. And, you know, I sell prints to collectors. And one of the ways I make a lot of money is having Richard go after all the people who illegally use my photos without my permission, and we go after them and we sue them in court. Uh, so uh, along those lines, Neil, tell, me, tell us about uh, uh, one of your cases. You know, I guess more specifically, you wanna talk about the Motley Crue case? Well, we can talk about Motley Crue. So I was in the Bahamas with my girlfriend one day, and I'm walking downtown Nassau, and I see my friend, uh, uh, Johnny D drummed with uh, Dora Pesh and Brittany Fox. And I'm like, wait a second, he's wearing a shirt. I see these four photos, they look like mine. So I walk up to him, hey, Johnny, nice t shirt. What is that, a bootleg? He's like, no, Neil, this isn't a bootleg. I bought this from Hot Topics. This has cost me probably $40, $50. I'm like, what? So when I got back to LA, I went to the Hot Topics site, saw that Motley Crew shirt with about two or three other shirts with my images of Motley Crue. Do I go, they never license any of that stuff from me. So 
Then I started doing some more investigative work. And I saw that there were other companies telling, selling quite a bit of my Motley Crew images on a ton of other product projects. I think, I think during the, uh, what do they call it? Uh, discovery, that's what it was. During discovery, they admitted that they sold $650,000 worth of merchandise with nine different Motley Crew images of mine on it none of which they ever paid me for to use or which they licensed from me. Yeah, that's unbelievable. I mean, it, it, and, and this could happen to any one of you, you know, if you're happen to be, you know, great, uh, you know, take a photograph and next thing you know, you know, your photograph appears on merchandise, you know, you may have a claim just like uh, uh, Neil, you know, and, you know, a lot of this stuff is being a great investigator, right? Neil, if you weren't on the cruise in the Bahamas, right? Could, would you have found out about, you know, Motley Crue and the, all the other companies using your, you know, photographs? And uh, probably not. But after that, I remember one day I was at the Whiskey A Go-Go and this guy walked by and he had a Motley Crue shirt with my image. So, you know, I mean, by the way, I was on a rock and roll cruise, the Monsters of Rock Cruise. So that's why everybody was wearing their favorite rock band t-shirts and so on and so forth. You know, so what do you call it? That's, you know, one of the reasons why I saw it. If I was on an old person cruise with grandma and grandpa Moses, I probably would never have seen that shirt with my images, but I just happened to see it. And that turned out to be an interesting lawsuit because they fought this to the end and they claimed, oh no, we bought those images and we paid you to do the shoot. And one of the things Richard's getting at was you know, two of the photos were on their second album, actually their third, Theater of Pain. And they hired me to do a photo shoot. But my invoice, which is the one Richard said that I found from 1984, specifically said, invoice for photo session with Motley Crue for inner sleeve and back cover of their new record just so important that you have everything lined up and that you get all the invoices in place uh, and that, you know, when someone comes back to you and says, oh, you know, where's their, um, you know, where's the license? What, what does it say? Neil, you know, found the invoice from, you know, 1984 and there it goes. Once again, I produced the invoice from 1984. You said at the deposition, Nikki was so flustered that he actually, when he saw that invoice, got up and left the room in a tizzy. So, so, you know, one of my things is I keep receipts and paperwork for everything. I still have records of mine from 1970 when I lived at my mother's house and used to hand write everything. And, you know, back then, you know, if I gave Cree magazine two, two Led Zeppelins and three Rod Stewart's and five Who's, I have handwritten notes with the date and who they got sent to. And then if they ever send them back, which back in those days, you know, wasn't a common thing, I would have, okay, returned on this date, one Led Zeppelin, two Rod Stewart's and two Who's. So you gotta be a paper hound. You gotta keep all your paperwork. I, I told you before, if I go to the bathroom at a gas station and it's a pay toilet and I pay a nickel to go pee, I want a receipt for that nickel. And I probably have that receipt from 30 years ago. So it's really important to save all your paperwork, especially invoices and contracts. And I have thousands and thousands of invoices and contracts. I have so many four drawer file cabinets here. I don't have any more room for anything else, so. Okay, so yeah, so. Uh, Neil, second tip, review and save everything. So it's so important because, you know, people come up to me and say, you know, all the time, like, uh, oh, I lost this. I lost that. And I said, oh, I wish you saved all this stuff because it could add to your case, right? And save now. Even if you didn't save, you know, years ago, start doing it now, right? There's no problem with, you know, uh, uh, starting now. Just like registering your work with the copyright office, you know? Do it now, even though, you know, you may have archives of years and years of photographs that you haven't done, start now, you know, so that in the future, you know, if your work is infringed upon, you could go after them, you know, the infringer for statutory damages, 
you know, it's so important, you know, that you do that, you know. Uh, and Neil, we uh, uh, also, we talked about, you know, uh, we had another question about how important it is in terms of the contracts that you write, you know, to, to the clients and about your key phrase, all other uses must be renegotiated. And how has that, how has that helped you over the years? How important is that phrase? Well, let's just put it this way. Uh, getting back to the contracts, I never, I don't think in my career has ever given a client a contract. Now, back in the early days, there were no contracts. I mean, back in the 70s and 80s, you did a photo shoot, you gave them an invoice, and that was it. But nowadays, every company wants to give you a contract for anything you do. And you got to remember something. The contracts are not there to help you. They're there to help the people writing the contracts. They're written by the lawyers for the big ass companies who don't care if you're crossing the street and got hit by a car and laying there dying in the street with maggots eating your body. They don't care. They just want to squeak as many uses and you know rights out of you as possible. I mean, throughout my years, I've had so many conversations where people have called me up like, hey, Neil, we want to use this photo on the inside of a next Poison album. How much do you want to use it on an inner sleeve? And we'll negotiate a price. And usually there's always haggling. And we negotiate a price. And then the contract comes. And it basically says, we own it for perpetuity. You're giving the copyright to us. We own it for publicity, advertising, promotion, everything you can imagine. And that's not what we spoke about on the phone. So they're always, no matter what your conversation is on the phone, I always write the description on my invoice, use for inner sleeve, use for publicity, use for promotion for you know six months, six years, whatever. And the magic word is all other uses must be renegotiated. So that's the way I feel about contracts and stuff. I've signed thousands of them. And I don't think one of the contract was ever to my liking. And I usually have to call the client up and go, no, we didn't talk about this. And this wasn't brought up in a conversation. So take this out, change this before I sign it. And most of the times they will do what I ask them to do. There's been times where I just had to just throw the job away or you know, the licensing away because they all oh, our legal department just can't change that. Well, then pay me more money or I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to sign it. So. And I think that's an important lesson for everyone that, you know, sometimes the best thing to do is walk away. You know, you don't have to take everything, you know, every particular license. If they're going to put into the agreement that they uh, want to work for hire or give away the copyright to your, your hard work that you go at and, and, and get, or, you know, there's a phrase in there that they want it in perpetuity for forever, you know, for a low price, you know, don't be afraid to say no and walk away. And I think that's just so important that you understand that because then, you know, some, uh, they may come back to you. Maybe they come back to you if they really want your photographs, right? And they really want it, they may agree, you know? Um, so it's important to remember, you know, it's okay to say no. You don't have to say yes to everything. You could simply, you know, if you want to keep the relationship with the particular, you know, entity, a magazine or a newspaper, you could just simply say nicely, you know, uh, you know, uh, sorry, I have to pass on this one. You know, uh, feel free to contact me in the future uh, if you want to license any of, of my other uh, photographs. You know, Neil, something I know that uh, probably many of the audience wants, audience wants to know is social media. You know, do you post things on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter? What do you do? Well, look, I'm an old guy. You know, I'm old school. First of all, A, I hate Facebook, okay? I can't stand Facebook. <laughs> Instagram's different because I get to look at some good photos on there, whether it's car photos or photos of some of my hot chick girlfriends or whatever, but in general, I don't really post anything on Instagram or Facebook. I have someone who runs my two sites, but I told them time and time again, and I think I remember you had a case, Richard, where 
someone put something on Facebook and someone else lifted the photo and the photographer tried to sue them. But since their profile wasn't set to private, I think once they post it on their Facebook page or Instagram page, and if it's not set to private and someone else uses it, that's in the terms that you sign when you sign up for a Facebook or Instagram account. Is that correct? Uh, well, no, when you, so when you sign up for Facebook, uh, the very small terms uh, that no, uh, Facebook uh, doesn't want you to see, the very small print, it says that you're granting Facebook a license to use your photographs. No one else could do it, uh, but you're granting Facebook a license. Uh, now, uh, one of the cases that I had was that um, I, I had a photographer that contacted Facebook using their, uh, their agent, their DMCA agent, and Facebook came back and said, no, we're not going to remove the photograph because we believe it's fair use. Now, at that time, you could sue Facebook because they refused to take down your, your photographs, right? That's uh, basically, um, you know, the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, where social media such as just Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, they're immune from liability because they would get sued left and right every day for someone posting a photograph on their Instagram page or on their Facebook page without permission. So they're granted uh, basically something called a safe harbor. So meaning that if uh, someone contacts Facebook and uh, they tell them where the photograph is, where the URL is, and they, uh, they take it down, then they're immune. But you could go after the person that posted your photograph and you know that could be a business or it could be an in individual. So it really, really depends. So I think the lessons uh, learned from social media is be careful uh, what you post. You know, there's some cases that came out over the past, uh, you know, few months about, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, media outlets embedding content from Instagram. Uh, and it's still a very gray area. You know, the courts are kind of like going back and forth. You know, now it's a uh, little bit in the, the favor of the photographer saying that, you know, the, the terms of service, uh, you know, on Facebook, do not grant, you know, a sub license to a third party. That's not what it means, but it's still a very gray area, you know, um, but I would be careful. I would maybe put things on private settings, like on your Instagram page, put it on private. I know many of you come up, uh, many of you have said to me, you know, uh, oh, but what happens if a media outlet wants to see my work and it's not on public? You know, you could send them a link, you know, send them a link to your, your private account or they could contact, um, you know, to uh, you to, you know, or, or you know, uh, like your page or, you know, uh, join your Instagram account, uh, account and see your work. So I think it's very, very important. Now, Neil, on another point, do you watermark your work? Yeah, so I water, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very careful about my photos. I mean, I've worked my whole lifetime to accumulate and you know shoot some of the biggest people in the world so i never put my photos out anywhere they usually say copyright niels lowe's hour with my agency i share with eddie maluk new york photographer we started an agency he'll say atlas icons but yeah i don't usually i mean we see them in front of here now with no watermark because that's because i trust you guys i know you aren't going to do anything with them but Yes, I always put in my watermark usually big and bold and obnoxious, just like I am. It's not some little teeny thing in the small corner that anybody with 10 extra minutes could remove easily with Photoshop. I like it right in the middle of the page. So it would be, I mean, they could still remove it, but it would be a lot harder to remove. So yes, you definitely always want to put a copyright and that way, if someone uses it and they purposely remove the copyright, I believe you could even ask for more money and damages because they intentionally remove the copyright. Yeah, and that's a great point. So if you uh, put a watermark on your photographs and next thing you know, an outlet crops out the watermark, there's something in the law called the removal of copyright management information. And what does that mean? That means that uh, if someone removes your copyright management information, you could sue someone for statutory damages up to $25,000 uh, per uh, infringement, in addition to the copyright infringement claim. So that could enhance the damages, you know, uh, um, gratefully. And in addition, it shows willfulness, right? Imagine you're up in, front, uh, in a jury. You know, look, you know, they uh, removed my watermark on the, uh, the photograph that shows willfulness. 
and you could potentially get, you know, the $150,000, you know, uh, statutory damages ranges. So just so important that, uh, that you watermark your work. All the photos on Atlas icons, my photo agency with Eddie Malouk, they're all metadata because it also helps if people are searching for something. So metadata is important in this day and age. And in my metadata, we have a feel, please contact Eddie Malouk or Niels Lozauer before you use the photos to negotiate a licensing fee and so on. So, you know, it says that right there in the metadata. So if someone rips off a photo, we could say, hey, on Atlas Icons, it says right here, please contact Niels Lozauer or Eddie Malouk to negotiate a licensing fee before you use it, not after you use it. So, okay. you know, I'm, I'm very careful on all my covering my tracks, you know, with copyright notices and so on and so forth. So. That sounds great. And Neil, where have you seen your work used uh, without permission before? You know? Everywhere you can imagine, okay? I mean, Richard, we've probably had 30 or 40 different settlements from different people. Some of them three or four times the same company, you know? I mean, there's one company, I won't to mention the name, we've probably had $100,000 worth of settlements with this one company, you know? And they still don't learn. I think we still have a few more to go after with them, hint, hint. So <laughs> anyway, but I mean, if, I want, if I'm sitting here bored and I want to make money, all I have to do is type in Motley Crue, Van Halen, Guns N' Roses, and do a Google image search. And my, my stuff is all over the internet, illegally. And a lot of it's not even in America. It's in Brazil and you know, Spain and Japan and Russia, you know, we can't go after those, but you know, the ones in the United States, we can go after and we've done pretty good myself in Leibowitz law firm. So. All right. Very nice. So Neil, tell us about, you know, um, like what was your, do you have a, a memorable uh, photo shoot? You know, anything that really stood out that you thought was like really, really fun or something memorable with a band? Well, you know, the Motley Crue blood shoot was great, but, you know, back then, Nikki was like, Nikki, you know, from Motley, the leader, and Robin Crosby from Rat, you know, they were two of my closest friends, so, you that know, was, Vince was getting that. married the next day from that shoot right there that you see in front of your eyes. Vince was getting married the next day. I know he did not want to be at a photo shoot when the next day he's getting married, so uh, Mick, Tommy, and Vince left. And Nikki, we, since he was my best friend back then, was like, hey, Zalo, you want to do some more photos? So, you know, we just got really sick and crazy, got a bottle of Jack Daniels. And then the, the shots of Nikki in particular, after the rest of the band, left, those, those were just fantastic shots. Those are probably some of the most iconic Motley Crue photos they ever did. But, you know, I try to have a good time in every shoot I do, whether it's with Steve Vai or whether it was with Rad or, you know, Guns N' Roses was always interesting to shoot. You know, there was one time when the band showed up, but no Axel. And we're waiting around and we're waiting around. Well, there's no band shots without Axel. So we did individuals and the rest of the band. And then about two days later, Axel did call me up, which I was in presence at. Hey, Neil, it's Axel. He goes, look, he goes, if I showed up that day, everybody in the room's life would have been really miserable. But I'm going to make it up to you. So he came back another day with the band and we did photos which appeared on the cover of Rolling Stone and Spin. And to this day, I still sell those photos of Guns N' Roses that I shot in 1988. And that's when, you know, the band first popped on the scene and, you know, they were young and looked great and skinny and, you know, they could do no wrong back in 1987 through 89. So then they took a break to record use your illusion and things weren't ever quite the same if you ask me but you know i always have a good time whatever i do i like to have fun you're only on this planet once so might as well make the most of it and i like to entertain my subjects i mean most of the photographers i know in this day and age when they're shooting someone they're just going click 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 there's no interaction there's no guidance and if i was in a band i'd go Hmm, is, is this what the photographer wants me to do? Do I look okay? Is my hair okay? But 
they just don't, there's no conversation between the subject and the artist anymore. And as you guys can probably tell, I got a big mouth. So there's never any shortage of words. And I used to have my little speeches to prop the rock stars up, you know, before they, I actually start shooting them to get into that mental mode of being a rock star. Cause you got to remember the people I work with, they're musicians. They aren't models. They don't know how to pose. So a lot of times they just get up there like four, just like goons and just stand there like, okay, what do you want us to do? So I try to set a mindset to get them into the, the mode of being a rock and roll God and, you know, try to get the best photos possible. That's great. Neil. Now, um, what about model releases? Did you have to ever get model releases for like commercial purposes? Over the well, years? not for any artist I've shot. So no, I never got a model release for Tom Petty or Poison or Rad or anybody. If we actually used other people like models in the shoot, because there was times in the 80s where we'd get hot chicks for the photo shoots to be on the cover of a album or whatever. And, you know, obviously with people other than the bands, you would need a model release. You know, or if I was doing a Van Halen shoot and they'd have hot girls in the videos, the girls would need to sign photo releases so they didn't come back and sue the band later and say, oh, you used my image and I never allowed it, even though they're there at the photo shoot and they're getting paid and they're posing. But, you know, people change and, you know, a lot of people, Americans are sue happy. So, you know, you just got to cover your butts at all times. That's what the clients do when they give you a contract. They cover their butts. So that's a great point. I mean, just going along with model releases, right? So for many of you, you know, that shoot, you know, let's say portraits or let's say you're just out and about, right? Like, let's say shooting a protest or, or, or just shooting just everyday life, you know. Uh, uh, well, pretty much the bottom line is that for commercial purposes, you know, uh, for let's say merchandise, for t-shirts, mugs, uh, you know, that you need to get the subject matters permission, but for editorial, uh, for, you know, anything along those lines, uh, social media, you do not. And Neil, obviously working with the band, you know, the band obviously gets the record labor's permission to use their name and likeness on, on the album covers. And then the band gets uh, Neil's permission, right, to use, uh, um, you know, his photographs, right? Neil owns the copyright to the photographs that he takes. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the um, record label, right, has an invoice, you know, with Neil outlining what they could use it for. Um, so I think that's very important. So what I want to do now is I want to open up uh, uh, the line to some questions. Uh, and uh, for both Neil and I, uh, what questions does everyone have for us? And uh, Jess, anything, uh, uh, let us know. Yes, um, so this is from Michael for Neil. Uh, those hot topic images that we were talking about earlier, are those registered? Did you have to have those registered? Those imager, images, I believe, were registered. I mean, when myself and Eddie Malouk started our photo agency, Atlas Icons, in 2011, I saw what was happening in the world of photography with digital images. It's so easy to, like, steal and infringe on images. And I knew a lot of that would happen, especially with my images. So I gave my kid, who at the time was probably about 15 years old, the monumental job of starting to register all my images with the copyright office. Now, this is way before I ever met Richard and Leibowitz Law Firm and so on. So slowly but surely, we took most of my iconic images and started registering them back then. So yes, I believe the images were all registered before the lawsuit. Do you want to add to that, Richard? Oh, yeah, no, I think it's just very important, you know, build it through the workflow, you know, get your work yeah, let, in the copyright office and, uh, you know, then you're golden, you, you have it, you know, Copyrights seventy uh, lasts right seventy years after the author's death. You know? let, let me add one more thing to that for all you people who are all of a sudden going to get all excited and go copyright your work. There's a couple of things to remember. You either register them as published or unpublished. Now, to be on the safe side, I registered everything in, as published. But then, 
they ask you what year was the year that they were first published. And that's where it gets tricky. And that's where, let's just say, my downfall was in a lot of the Motley Crue photos. Because I've had hundreds of thousands of photos published in my career. And I can't go, oh, this Jimmy Page was published in 75, and this Motley Crue was 87, and this Rat was published in 84, and this Steve Vai was 2015. So we took a generalization and said, uh, we use the date that my images were first put up on Atlas icons as the first year they were published. And Motley Crue came back and basically said, well, these two images you said were published in 2012, but they were really published in 1985 on Theater of Pain. So the courts could have thrown those two out. And then four of my images were published in my Motley Crue book, which came out in 2009. Once again, we said they were first published in 2012 or 13. So the courts could have thrown those four images out. So what I'm getting at, sometimes with the, the, when you register, it's really important how you dot your I's and cross your T's, okay? Just because you have them registered, that's one hurdle that you're past, but you have to have your facts pretty much on the button because if we went to court, Motley could have thrown eight of the nine images of mine out of court saying they were first published in 2012 or 13, and they proved that eight of the nine were published before that. So the judge could have thrown those out and said, Neil, well, we saw the one image, but we're gonna make you pay for Motley's lawyer's fees since eight of the nine images were throwing out of court. And we didn't want that to happen. So we had to settle for a reasonable amount, but nothing near what we thought we were gonna get. So yeah. make sure all your facts and everything are right when you're registering your images. Yeah, I think it's just so important. Get the date of first publication right. You know, just make sure that you build to the workflow. Put in a, 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 a folder on your desktop. Just say, here are all the photographs that are published on this date. And then you want to also back that up with evidence, right? Maybe take a screenshot or keep the magazine or keep the newspaper. So I think it's very, very important that you get that all right. That's a great question. Thanks for asking. All right. Great. Now, Karen is asking, and this is for Neil again, uh, what do you say when someone wants you to give or email them photos for free? I think she's referring to friends, like someone who might say, hey, dude, can you email me a few photos? Okay, well, Karen, you know, it depends. If you're talking about like a photo you shot at a party and they're in the photo, you know, that's one thing. I mean, it's a friend of yours and so on. You don't have to worry about it being used on a merchandising t-shirt and someone making hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever. So. Listen, I give people in my old age, I have friends, I give them free photos all the time. But people go on Atlas Icons, my photo agency, hey, Neil, I want to download this photo of Slash, or I want to download this photo of Led Zeppelin. How do I go about it? Well, if we don't know the person and we get the idea, it's just a fan that wants to make a print for the wall. We don't really do that, okay? I've worked too hard in my career to give people access to my Led Zeppelin and Rolling Stones and Van Halen photos. They, I do sell prints to collectors and they aren't cheap, but a lot of people buy prints to hang on their walls at home for me. But like I said, it depends. If a friend of yours said, oh, you shot a photo of my dog Fido and I wanna hang a picture, yeah, fine, give it to him. I mean, you know. You probably aren't going to have much luck licensing it to anybody except maybe a greeting card company or a, a calendar company who may think the photo's cute and want to license it for next to no money and put it on a card or a calendar. But I usually just can't give people I know access to scans or, you know, high-res images of mine. What about as a follow-up, the bands? Have the bands ever asked you for free photos that you've taken of them and how do you handle that? All the time. Listen, I hate to say this and this may sound bad, but in my mind, being a photographer is the most worthless profession right now. No one respects photographers. Everybody with an iPhone or a digital camera thinks they're a photographer and no one wants to pay for photography. Do you know, I have big companies call me up and they're like, 
hey, Neil, we want to use this photo. Okay, what's your budget? Well, we don't have a budget, but we'll give you a photo credit. I'm like, look, after 50 years, I don't need the photo credit. If you go on my personal site, Zlows.com, I have probably over 800 magazine covers. Not little inside photos, but covers to my name. I don't need the photo credit anymore, you know? So, so I just, and basically I'll go, look, you're calling me and you want to use it. Do you get paid to play a gig or when you put an album out, do you get paid? Well, I get paid for what I do. I'm a photographer. That's how I pay my bills, licensing photos. So it just, you know, I mean, everybody wants something for free in this day and age. I hate to say it, so. Yeah, this is a question about, um, we spoke a little bit about model releases before, but when you own the copyright to a photograph, should you also get model releases from the band members? So do you have releases for every band member when you're shooting them? No, I've never gotten a, a, a release from any band member in my 50 year career. I mean, if I'm shooting, first of all, if I'm shooting them live, someone gave me a photo pass to be there. Okay, so that's basically they're acknowledging that we're giving you permission to shoot this band and you're either going to place it in magazines or whatever you're going to do with it. They aren't giving me permission to make t-shirts and sell them out front of the band's next 10 shows, but me being a professional and having a reputation, they know I'm not going to do that. Okay, but and then if they come to my studio, say Guns N' Roses come to my studio, well, just by showing up in my studio, they're giving me permission to shoot them as a band or individual shots. Now, I know other photographers that have shot bands and have tried to sell fine art prints, and they've got cease and desist from the band. And the funny thing is most of the bands would only benefit because these were like has-been bands that had no life left and no career left. But of course, they gave the photographer a cease and desist. Now, don't ask me why. I've never had any. So I've never had any problems at all putting out photos w with whatever. Like I said, I don't make t-shirts and go sell them at Hot Topic or bootleg them and sell them in front of a Motley Crue show or whatever. But, you know, maybe some people do. They don't understand. You can't do that. That's not a professional thing to do. Yeah, so pretty well, much... That was I'm yeah. sorry, I just want to ask another question before you weigh in, because you might be weighing in on this, Richard. It's the, you know, part of the question is, are you allowed to sell prints to fans or collectors, uh, those photographs that you take of bands? If you sell them, then do you need a model release? Are you saying that that's not, um, that's kind of a taboo meal? Well, I have quite a few galleries that sell my prints, and I've never had a problem. I think when you sell fine art prints, you're allowed to do that because it's a, it, it's my work. It's, you know, yeah, it's I a feel, fine I, art I, print. I, I, I can come in here, you know, so if it's a limited run, then you don't need to get permission. So like Neil, fine art prints in his uh, galleries, right? Limited run. If there's uh, hundreds of thousands of posters, that's another thing that you, you will need to get the, uh, a model release because you're mass producing them. But for limited quantity, you know, uh, that's fine. You do, do not need a model release. And, you know, just along this, uh, the same point, you know, Neil had relationships with the, the band members and the band members, you know, relied upon him. And, you know, what Neil was using the photographs for, for editorial, right? For editorial, you do not need a model release, you know, for a newspaper, a magazine cover, you do not need a model release only for uh, commercializing it, you know, an advertisement or a, a t-shirt or, you know, merchandise. That's when you need to get the models permission. And a lot of the bands, you know, they'd have relationship with the, you know, the, the merchandising companies anyway. So they would get the permissions anyway from, from the band and uh, Neil would give the permissions, you know, uh, the copyright permissions. So, you know, it's a hand in hand type of thing, you know, uh, sometimes, you know. That's great. That was really helpful. I think that answers those that set of questions. Um, this is from L. Uh, if you're a member of the press invited to a public paid sporting event and you captured close-ups of the athletes, do you need permission from the athletes in order to sell it? And I guess this kind of goes back to what you were talking about before. Exactly. So, okay, we'll take that example. If you uh, photograph, you know, someone at a stadium or, 
you know, um, you know, or, or anything, a protest um, for editorial purposes, right? For online, if you're publishing uh, online or your social media or uh, a magazine for editorial, you do not need permission. Uh, but if it's a close up and you see the person's face and they're recognizable, and you need you want to use it for commercial purposes, such as you know putting on a T-shirt or mass producing it on a poster. Then yes, you would need to get the model's permission. But it would need to be a close-up. It needs to be recognizable. If it's the back of their head or it's uh, the person's not recognizable, let's say half of their face and they don't realize it, um, uh, or no one could recognize them, then you may not need their permission. So you know, um, I think that's pretty much the the, the short answer to that. That's great. Um, this is a little bit of a pivot, but Ron is asking if Leibowitz Law Firm has any canned license agreements from which uh, people who are on this webinar can begin or maybe can have access to. Yeah, I mean, listen, feel free to, you know, uh, to reach out to us. Um, you know, uh, we do have, you know, sample uh, templates of, you know, of licensing uh, agreements. You know, you could just contact us, info at LeibowitzLawFirm.com, and we'd be happy to, you know, help guide you with a, with a template that you could help out in terms of uh, licensing. But, you know, as we talked about earlier in the presentation, you know, having those few things, right, the, the time period, how long they're going to use it for, where they're going to use it for, and payment. I think those are the three cr crucial terms. Uh, and, you know, in very plain English, that's important to have. And what Neil has in all of his agreements, right? Time period, right? How much money, you know, and uh, where they could use it. I think those are the, uh, you know, three main points. Great. Uh, this is from Michelangelo. He's asking if you can register images that were submitted and accepted at stock agencies. Oh yeah, I mean, in terms of registering your work with the copyright office, I think it's important that if when when you submit it to the the, the stock photo agency, uh, that's date of first publication generally, right? You're you're first publishing on an agency's website, and then you want to make sure that all your photographs that you uh, provide that are published, you know, give it to the photo agency or I'll register with the copyright office. And it doesn't matter when you do it. If you gave it to a photo agency, you know, ten years ago, you know, or five years ago. You know, uh, it doesn't matter when you register it. I just like um, to register within three months of first publication to get the higher damages if there's an infringement. But, you know, there's nothing lost if you register all your work now, you know, so it's very important that you do that. Okay, this is a conversation or a question about um, the legal standards regarding using your prints. Um, so is how is selling a fine art print different than a t-shirt um, and you know maybe Neil you can also speak about uh, how do you use the photos that you take in books on the cover of a book inside of a book to make a book of images and so on what are the legalities there do you want to go first Richard you could go ahead Neil go ahead well all the books I mean two things if someone's making a a book it depends on what the book is i mean you know i have people approach me all the time we're doing a motley crew book we're doing a van halen book blah 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 okay i'll sell them or i'll license them an image to use and usually on books i mean i have six books or five books out myself i don't even remember five or six books out myself okay and obviously, they're all my photos. I never went to one artist and got a release, and there's people like Eric Clapton or Motley Crue or whatever, because I think books, you can legally use someone's image. So, you know, now, you know, it's different if you're writing a story about someone, because my books are all photo books, and I own the copyright to the images. So I don't have to, I don't have to license anything from anybody. But you know, I mean, there's, you know, book companies, Hal Leonard, that's done thousands of books, you know, and uh, they, you know, if they're doing an Eric Clapton music book, you know, where they show his musical notes, they got to get Eric's permission, but, and they usually need to get the approval for the image on the cover. But, you know, there's thousands of books on the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and Guns N' Roses and whoever. I don't believe it's necessary to get permission or give the artist any money to use their image on the cover of a book or even inside of a book. 
Now, Richard could correct me I mean, if I'm wrong. I think ultimately, I mean, um, you know, it's editorial, right? A book is editorial, you know, um, and I think that that's fine, you know, and, um, you know, you could write a book about a particular band and use your images or license images for your book. And uh, you may not need to get the band's permission, you know, to do that. That's that's editorial, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, putting it on a T-shirt. And just going back to the question, I mean, the, the difference between, you know, uh, mass producing posters and, you know, and, and just doing, um, you know, uh, uh, images, you know, uh, limited prints, um, you know, uh, the law pretty much just says that, you know, if you're mass producing, you, you know, you're commercializing, right? You're making a lot of money off of these posters. You're making tens of thousands of copies of it, but limited prints, right? One of a hundred or one of 200, right? It's limited. So in that particular, uh, circumstance, you know, the law allows the photographer to make money without, you know, binding himself, uh, from, you know, getting the permission from the subject matter. They don't, they don't want that. They want to explore, allow people uh, the creative ability and, and, and business mind to sell their work and put it on frames and, and do you know, uh, limited runs. That's fine. And you see it all the time, right? You go into a gallery you know, and you see one of uh, 50 or, or one of 10, you know, and uh, they're not getting the particular subject matter's permission, you know, uh, the person that's in it. You know, it's just the copyright holder's permission. So I think it's important to know those uh, those two two things. Is there a specific number, Richard, or is it a case by case basis? Uh, you know, I think the the law is very gray. I mean, I think it's w when it c comes down to it, like mass producing. I mean, what's a lot? I mean, is a hundred a lot? You know, I I think that you know you know you're looking at like thousands of of posters. I think that at that point it gets to like the mass producing aspect of it. You know, limited. Yeah. Yeah, one, one more thing. When you're talking about fine art prints, you're usually talking about a print that was made from the original negative or color slide or even a high res scan, okay? But, you know, posters are mass produced with on lousy paper with lousy ink and the printing's usually not that great. So that's, you know, and, you know, they may even have a price tag printed right on the poster. So, you know, where the fine art prints are a little higher quality, just, you know, a more luxurious product, if you ask me. Got it. Thank you, guys. Okay, this is a bit of a longer question. It's from Carol. Uh, she says, I'm considering purchasing slides and photos from an older photographer who is now in his 80s. He has images of many, many famous artists from back in the 70s. He did copyright them. Uh, there were no agreements signed, and they were not works for hire. She says that she's reasonably certain that he does own the copyright. And she asks, what about the image? Does clearance have to happen now with their estates of the artist, um, most of whom have passed? Or can the image be used without permission by virtue of the fact that the photographer owns the right. Is that clear? Let me say one thing. First of all, when a photographer shoots the photos, he automatically owns the copyrights, but that's different than registering them with the copyright office. So if he just says he owns the copyrights because he shot them, that's one thing. You got to find out if he says they're registered with the copyright office. And then if he says they are, Tell them to produce a copyright registration. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, it's a, it's a great question and it does come up a lot. You know, you get a lot of, you know, um, you know, photographers or their families that uh, have these uh, slides from years ago and uh, they want to sell them. Um, and I think that in terms of um, what you as the owner, uh, what rights you have, I think it's important that you get everything in writing. You know, you know, today you get, you, you know, you write an email, right, to the, the person that's selling and you get their, um, uh, you get in writing and you say, uh, it's, it's, uh, I own the copyright to these slides and I am selling the slides to you, you know, as uh, now the purchaser. 
And you want to also make sure that in that particular writing, you know, if you're going to be buying the particular uh, slides, um, that the, the copyright that, you know, if you're going to buy it from them, uh, that potentially there's a transfer of copyright because then you can't really do anything with them. I mean, you could have the, the slides and you could, you know, have that as, you know, as, as value. But if you're purchasing something and someone else doesn't want them anymore, you know, you want to do something, you want to get the copyright to it because then you can't really do anything. Because then what you could do is then you could, you know, whatever, you could um, potentially, you know, use it and, and market yourself or commercialize it. So I think it's important to note that you have it, but you want to do a little background research on the seller. You want to make sure, does that particular person actually own the rights to, to the slides? Or did they buy it from someone else who bought it from someone else and down the road? And next thing you know, someone comes back to you, you know, 10 years later and says, oh, that particular person actually stole the slides, you know, from me. I had a, a yard sale and somehow these photographs were put on the side and it was stolen. Or, you know, with today with eBay, right? Neil, how many times have you seen your photographs on eBay? You know, slides or anything like that? Way too many. <laughs> I mean, and all the time you go onto eBay, I mean, how many bootleg things or old slides? It's not necessarily, you know, uh, that these, you know, um, sellers actually own them. They probably just bought them somewhere, you know, and they don't really own the copyright to it. So it's important just to do due diligence, you know, find yes. out where you got, where the photographs came from and do a little due diligence, just like, you know, if you were a publisher, you know, the publisher is going to want to find out who owns the copyright you know, and all this stuff, you as yourself, when you're buying these slides, just do some due diligence. Yeah, you know, with me, with ahead, me, my, my books that I have, one's a Motley, one's a Van Halen, anybody could buy one of my books, they could tear a page out, scan the page, do a little Photoshop work, and they can make prints from there. So my stuff's all over eBay, people selling prints for $10, $15, you know, posters and, and all over the place, you know. I had a follow-up, Rich, from Carol that I wanted to tell you. She said that this man was the photographer and she has found the existing copyrights at the Library of Congress. She's just wondering about the image and the likeness. Okay, so the image and likeness, yeah. Again, going along the, the lines of if you're going to be using the photographs for commercial purposes and if you're going to buy the slides from a photographer right and you're going to be using it for you know putting it on a t-shirt or putting it on a mug or putting it on an advertisement you know uh for those purposes you have to get the subject matters permission and you want to mm -hmm. take a look and see if the if it's clear right you want to make sure it's if it's the back of the person's head or if it's unrecognizable then you don't but if it's recognizable for commercial purposes, you do need to get the subject matters permission. But for editorial, if you're going to put it on your website or put it on your social media, you know, that's fine. You do not need to get the subject matters permission. This one is from Ian. He's asking, have you heard about these companies that reach out uh, to photographers by commenting on your social media with a message that says, please reply yes in order to give us permission. And then they link to their terms of use. Does, if you reply yes, does that count as giving away your rights? Does their message just uh, you know, count as giving away your rights as well? That's a great question, you know, and that comes up all the time. And what companies are doing today is they're using social media, you know, as almost like a photo agency, you know? Uh, companies are just going on Instagram or Facebook. They're looking for things to, uh, to use. Um, and what they're doing is they're trying to bind a photographer to a license by the photographer hashtagging yes. Like, yes, you know, let's say a brand name. Yes, you could use my image. Or if the brand says uh, to the photographer, you know, uh, could we use this for, you know, social media? Hashtag yes, you know, if, if we could do it. And if you do do it, then technically it's a license, right? It's you're granting them a, a license, but but don't be fooled, you know. Don't be be very careful what your what these companies do and are, you know, uh, what they're you know doing, uh, because technically, you know, if you do say yes, and you know, the, the, uh, you know, in the court of law, right? If it's in writing and you say yes, and you you know that pretty much grants them a license to use your uh, your photograph. 
So if you do, do not want them to use your, uh, your photograph, either say no, or if you, know, if you don't re respond you know, on time and they use it anyway, that's an infringement. Um, so there's a lot of these companies that are using you know, really you know, clever little you know, sneaky ways of trying to license content, uh, but just be careful. You know, be very careful when you hashtag things uh, that you know, you know, technically it's not granting any of these brands or companies a license when you hashtag anything. But generally speaking, you know, when you do hashtag you know, a brand, let's say it's a photograph of a celebrity wearing a particular product and you hashtag the brand, you know, that does not grant the brand permission, you know, to use your, your photo, you know, um, that's not the case. It's just, you know, a lot of uh, photographers today are trying to brand themselves, you know, and um, doing these hashtags to make these brands aware, hey, look at this photograph I got of this celebrity wearing your particular item, contact me to license the, the, the photograph. And that's what the photographers, you know, are doing today. And that's a perfect way to market themselves. You know, and, and, you know, as Neil said, you know, you have to be a businessman, right? You know, you could be a great photographer, but in order to be successful as a photographer, you have to be a business person. And in today's world, you know, photographers are using social media to, to market themselves, hashtagging, um, you know, uh, putting the, the particular photographer's name, you know, putting the particular model or the actor's name, you know, associated with the photograph, create brand awareness, you know, it's fine. You know, but just be careful with the hashtags and what some of these brands say, you know, to you if they're messaging you, you know, um, and just be careful about the wording because it could technically bind you if there's, you know, if there's a license. This is from S. I'm sorry, I don't know your, your full name. He asks, Richard, could you please explain the basic tenets of licensing and how to legally approach the subject? Also, the differences between licensing agreements and other editorial publication rights. Okay. So, yeah. So, I guess uh, the basic, you know, answer to that is, um, you know, it's just so important that, you know, uh, you negotiate a license, you know, and someone just can't just use your work without your permission, you know. And as I say to all my clients, it's like, you know, this, all this stuff is negotiable, you know. So, you know, they pick up the phone, you pick up the phone, you discuss uh, you know, hey, I want to use this particular photograph for this particular purpose, you know, and next thing you know, uh, you come to a deal. Uh, but you want to make sure that in that agreement, you put, okay, the, this particular photograph of Motley Crue is going to be used for uh, this particular uh, website, you know, this particular article, and you have it on there. You know, it's so important that you have that so that when you come back and you're trying to negotiate, you know, something down the road, or there's a um, you know, no meeting in the minds, you could whip it out and say, look, we have this signed agreement by both sides. Here it is. It's signed by you. It's signed by me. And next thing you know, the, the person who's in inquiring saying, mm, you know, you're probably right, you know, uh, you know, and then you negotiate uh, the particular terms. Let's say down the road, they want to use it for Facebook or they want to use it for Instagram. You know, it's so important that you have that uh, in the agreements. Um, and you have it in writing, you know, you don't want it down the road where it's a he said, she said type of thing. And it gets very messy. You know, I see that all the time with my clients where, you know, 10 years later, they say, you know, I had a relationship with the particular subject matter, or I had a relationship with the particular magazine, you know, uh, and I didn't think they were going to mess around with me and use it on an ad or use it on, you know, a book. And next thing you know, 10 years later, they actually do use it on a book. So it's just so important that you get everything in writing. You know, uh, you have the party name, the permissions granted, you know, the terms of the use, the payment term, and the deliverables, right? So, for example, the deliverables would be, you know, um, the particular entity wants um, a high res of the photographs. You know, how are you going to get it to them? Are you going to get it to them on a thumb drive? Are you going to get it to them on, you know, a CD? Are you going to mail it to them? Are you going to put it on a Dropbox, an FTP server? It's so important that you have these things, you know, all in writing. The payment terms, uh, which uh, when Neil comes uh, back on, he's going to uh, talk a little bit about that because I know that he has in his agreements, he has, you know, uh, that uh, payment needs to be first, that you have to get payment before um, you use the photographs. And that's important because uh, what happens down the road if, um, you know, you don't get paid and you have this agreement, you know, and you don't have the money. 
So it's important that you get those terms up front uh, and you know all that stuff before you're actually, uh, you know, getting into any agreement. So that's the, uh, I think, uh, short answer to the question. Great, thank you, Richard. Now Paige asks, I was taught to always specify the uses as narrowly as possible in three domains, time, place, and quantity. Are there any other ways we should try uh, to narrow it down to, or I suppose, and to add to that, are there other domains that they should include in those agreements? Um, you know, I think that it's important to lay out, um, you know, how long they could use it for. I've seen it many times before where people come up to me and they say, you know, I had a, like a one or two year license, right? And if they go beyond uh, that license, you know, um, that time period, you could actually sue them for copyright infringement. And it happens all the time. So I've seen it before on like textbook cases, right? Um, where textbook companies uh, uh, license photographs from photographers uh, for a period of time uh, and for X amount of books. Uh, and next thing you know, the license expires, you know, after the end of the uh, uh, time period, let's say it's two years. And next thing you know, they ha uh, use it on new books uh, and they use it on, you know, 100,000 copies and you, you know, negotiated just for 50,000 copies. So you could sue them for copyright infringement. So I think that those probably four things, you know, uh, time period, place, usage, um, you know, I think, uh, I think is probably the key terms to have in your agreement. And understand, have a meeting of the minds. Make sure that, you know, when you are in negotiating the terms, put it in there. And it could be very short. Put it in an email. You know, it doesn't need to be like a formal, like, uh, you know, a formal potentially signed by both sides. If you have something in an email, you email it over to them. They agree. They say, okay, okay, that's fine. That, this is perfect. This is actually a follow-up to that. Uh, Peter is asking, is there specific language wording or is plain English good enough? Plain English good enough for the term? You know, plain English, I think is fine. You know, as Neil sa uh, said it, you know, always put the, you know, put easy phrase in there, you know, just like this. So Neil, you know, his, one of his tips is, you know, you put in there, all other uses must be renegotiated. You know, that's very simple. That's easy. You know, you don't need to be a lawyer to comprehend it. You know, you understand it. And as, as long as both sides understand, that's the most important thing. And it could be very easy. It could be a, a short line. This particular, um, you know, usage is for social media you know, photographers getting paid, you know, X amount of money for it, you know, the time period is one year, you know, from the agreement. And you make it very easy. And then at the end of the email or on the agreement, you just put all other uses must be renegotiated, you know, plain and simple, very easy. You don't want to make it complicated. And really, ultimately, you know, you, you want to make it easy for the courts down the road as well, right? You want to make it where, you know, if a judge is seeing an agreement and looking at it and saying, you know, oh, this seems very plain English. It's black and white, right? All other uses must be renegotiated, you know, and it makes sense. So um, I agree. Make it as clear and easy as possible. Great. Um, this is from Jerry. He says, I have photographs of Springsteen where he performed at a public event for President Obama. The event was open to the media. Can I sell these images? Okay. That's a, that's a, a great question. So uh, I'm going to generalize it and make it into like a, a general question. So uh, if you go shoot a particular, um, you know, person, you know, in a public space, you know, what could you do with it? Could you license it? Could you sell it? Um, you know, could you commercialize it? Well, the, the short answer to that is yes. You know, if you take a photograph and you're the one who takes the photograph, you own the copyright to the photograph, you know, no one else could claim ownership to the photograph and you yourself as a business person, right? Just like Neil said, be a, a better business person than a photographer. You can get the best shots of that particular subject matter, you know, in a public space. Um, and you could get, you know, make perfect lighting and everything like that, but be a better business person. What are you going to do after you take the photograph of that subject matter, right? It, uh, that you took up in that public space. Are you going to license it to media outlets? Are you going to be licensing it for commercial purposes? Are you going to be just using it on your social media site? Are you giving it to a photo agency? 
think about it. Think about before you are photographing someone, you know, what are you going to do with it? And uh, have that in the back of your mind. And you may want to uh, use that, you know, to your advantage in terms of being creative, you know, is uh, maybe you want to uh, focus, you know, more on, you know, uh, you know, let's say the crowd, let's say you're taking a photograph of subject matter, but you want to see the reaction of the crowd because you think that a newspaper or a magazine may actually uh, like that photograph better, you know, and think about that, be a better business person. Maybe you may not get, you know, maybe uh, they'll, in the crowd, let's say it's a public event, you know, and there are 30 other photographers there and everyone is shooting from that same angle, right? Maybe you want to get a different angle. Maybe you want to get a photograph of, you know, something different than no one else could ha uh, have so that when you're, you're offering the photograph, let's say to a magazine, right? Or a newspaper, or even for commercial purposes, right? You may have something different than anyone else. So you want to think about that. Think about that when you're going into the particular event and you know you're free to license the, your photographs in a public event that's fine you know the only thing is if you're licensing something for commercial purposes you know and you have a close-up of the person um and someone wants to use it let's say for a mat uh, for a uh, t-shirt or for a mug or for a keychain commercial purposes uh you will probably need to get the subject matters permission before you use the uh, photographs for the commercial purposes. Let's take that example, right? Let's take the example of like you're shooting a concert, right? So, you know, Neil took this photograph, you know, uh, he could uh, license the photograph for, you know, anything he wants, you know, could he license it to a newspaper? Of course, he could license it to a magazine, of course, you know, but if he wanted to license this for, um, you know, commercial purposes, such as, you know, for uh, merchandise, like a t-shirt or a mug, he would have to get the subject matters permission, you know. So, you know, it's so important to, uh, uh, to have that all lined up. Okay, we have another question from Adrian Wilson. Um, it's a two-part question. One is, do we have to submit all images we take to the copyright office? That's the first. Um, you want to answer that and then we'll get to the second one. So, yeah, so that's a great uh, question from Adrian. So it's very important that you get your photographs that are uh, published registered with copyright office. And the reason for that is because the likelihood that your work is going to get infringed upon is very high when your work is out in the public. So for example, let's say you are publishing these photographs, you know, on your website or you're publishing it on your social media sites or you're, you're providing the photographs to a photo agency, right? The likelihood, you know, whether it be now or five years from now or six years from now, the odds of your work being uh, infringed upon is very high today because it's so easy, right? You're going to go on the internet, right? Uh, you're going to go to Google Images. Uh, you're going to type in, you know, um, you know, slash, right? You know, you're going to type in, uh, you know, Michael Jackson, yeah, you're going to type in this. And, and ultimately, you know, all these photographs are going to be on the internet forever, right? It's important that you register your work with the copyright office so that in situations like that, right, you could go after the infringer for statutory damages, right? There's, um, uh, on a, a previous webinar, we, we talked about, you know, what the remedies are for copyright infringement and what you, be in, what you may be entitled to if there's an infringement, you know, and if your work is timely registered, right, within three months of first publication. So what is within three months of first publication? It means, let's say you post your photographs on social media, right? You have three months from the first date that you publish it, that's um, uh, considered, um, you know, within three months of first publication or within three months of when you put your photographs on a photo agency. So it's so important that you, you know, you get your stuff registered so that the situation like with Neil, right? You know, his photographs of Motley Crue were infringed upon by the band, you know, and it was years later, right? From 1984 all the way to, you know, just recently, you never know if your work, you know, is going to be infringed upon and you could uh, potentially get up to $150,000 per work if you see your work, you know, willfully, you know, infringed. So I just recommend everyone registering your work every three months, build it, build it into your workflow, you know, make sure that your work is just, you know, either on a folder on your uh, desktop or on your laptop and the end of the three months, get it all registered with the copyright office. So that's just really important that, uh, that you do that. Okay, we are out of time. It is 3.31. Okay, so I wanna thank Niels Lozauer very, very much. 
uh, for your participation. You know, um, you have some great words of wisdom, you know, today to share to everyone, you know, and I hope everyone, you know, learned a lot today, you know, and I appreciate everyone's participation. Uh, we're going to have a, a, another webinar next month. So keep a lookout for uh, your email on uh, the next webinar. So Neil, thank you so much for, uh, for today. Thanks for having me, folks. Hope you enjoyed it. All right. Any questions, feel free to contact us with anything you may need. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, folks. See you later.